Good evening and welcome to InfoWars Nightly News with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson, on this May 21st, 2012 edition. Tonight. You will not disrespect the President of the United States in this place. An audio recording between a teacher and a North Carolina high school student goes viral as she tells her students that it is a criminal offense to criticize Obama. Plus, the state of Hawaii responds to the Arizona Secretary of State's request for Obama's birth certificate. Then, the police state welcomes NATO as Mayor Emanuel has authorized militarized social control of Chicago and protesters who've clashed with police are being held on terrorism charges. All that plus more of tonight's top headlines in Syrian Girl joins us live via video Skype tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. Our top story tonight, teacher yells at student, criminal offense to criticize Obama. An audio recording of an exchange between a teacher and a student at North Rowan High School in North Carolina serves as a reminder that the school system is becoming a target or a training ground for teaching kids to be subservient to the state while indoctrinating them into thinking that the First Amendment does not exist. And this is an argument that was caught on a cell phone recording between a teacher and a student where the teacher's basically yelling over and over again it's illegal to criticize our dear leader you can't disrespect the president it's an arrestable offense as as a social studies teacher i cannot allow you to slander any president in here yes ma'am past or current yes ma'am okay you will not disrespect the president of the united states in this classroom i'll say what i want not not about him you won't and the school actually reacted. Massive controversy online, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on the video. But the school reacted by calling it a learning experience. And no action whatsoever was taken against the teacher, even though she's basically teaching her, her kids in the class that the First Amendment does not exist. And in the article, we actually put out an info was about this. You can go and watch a deluge of other videos where children in government schools are being taught to worship Obama and also chant mindlessly his campaign slogans. You'll all remember, of course, the infamous Obama military youth drill. Uh, the cult of personality is certainly still being built up around Obama as we head towards 2012. And in some cases, you know, it rivals the kind of thing you'd expect to see out of North Korea. Remember, also that in 2009 the white house actually announced that it would start broadcasting obama's speeches directly into classrooms and that the department of education uh, would instruct teachers to ask children quote why is it important that we listen to the president and other elected officials so they're getting in at an early stage getting into the schools and so not only are the schools now you know prison training centers with the surveillance cameras, the patrol cops, the drug raids, the fake attack drills, you know, watching kids via their webcams, the teachers in Pittsburgh, nothing happened. But they're also literally becoming re-education camps in that they train kids not to be suspicious of authority and not to question elected representatives, servants like the president himself, but to literally worship and praise Barack Hussein Obama like he's some kind of Christ figure. So again, another great reason to homeschool. AMC buyout part of Chinese takeover of media. Again, this is an Infowars.com story written by myself. Chinese company Wanda has announced it will buy AMC, the second largest theater chain in the United States, increasing fears that the Chinese Communist Party is expanding its influence globally as part of a media takeover. Beijing is investing heavily in projecting its soft power or cultural influence by boosting China's state media presence abroad, including the USA, where the Chinese government has also run advertisements in New York's Times Square, reports USA Today. So remember, of course, the remake for Red Dawn, you know, the classic Cold War 1984 film about the Russian troops invading. Originally, the remake in 2009 was supposed to feature 
Chinese troops invading America. That got switched because the production company, NGM, started getting calls from Chinese state media saying they didn't appreciate China being depicted in a negative light. And of course, the financial clout of such threats in terms of the Chinese market certainly made MGM sit up and take notice. And it, they actually had to mothball the film. It hasn't even been, been released yet, set to be released at the end of this year. Because they had to edit, they had to literally go into the film and edit out all the Chinese signage and props and replace them with those of North Korea. Because the Chinese government, the Chinese state media made it clear they weren't happy about it. So we've already had examples of Chinese communist censorship system imposing their financial clout through threats of intimidation against the Ameri American film market. And now we're going to get that to an even greater extent with this takeover. And the guy that actually owns Wanda, this company that have bought uh, all this big theater chain, is, quote, a Communist Party member who sits on the nation's top advisory council. He's the guy who's now running America's second largest theater chain. Government tyranny. Illinois Department of Agriculture secretly destroys beekeepers' bees and 15 years of research proving Monsanto's Roundup kills bees. This is out of natural news. An Illinois beekeeper with more than a decade's worth of expertise about how to successfully raise organic chemical-free bees is the latest victim of flagrant government tyranny. According to the Prairie Advocate Terence Terry Ingram of Apple River, Illinois, owner of Apple Creek Apiaries, recently had his bees and beehives stolen from him by the Illinois Department of Agriculture, as well as more than 15 years' worth of research proving that Monsanto's Roundup is the cause of colony collapse disorder. Again, they all, it appears as though he was targeted basically because of the 15 years worth of research. They went in and claimed that his bees had this, you know, rare, odd disease that nobody had ever heard of before. And they used it to go through all his, all his, you know, his beehives, all his records, completely trashed it, shut him down. And, you know, given the fact that Monsanto is buying up the very companies responsible for producing the studies that found that their pesticides and herbicides cause CCD. It's no surprise to see it now going to this level where they're directly going onto people's farms, no warrants whatsoever, and just shutting people down because the beekeepers, of course, they're the ones that are most aware of the uh, environmental holocaust that Monsanto's products are waging on the bee population. Uh, which is, of course, vital for world food security. Uh, and so, again, they basically just came on his land and destroyed everything he had, part of Monsanto's continuing campaign of terror against anyone who tries to expose them. Next story on InfoWorlds Nightly News, Jim Cramer is predicting bank runs in Spain and Italy and financial anarchy throughout Europe. During an appearance on Meet the Press on Sunday, Jim Cramer of CNBC boldly predicted that financial anarchy is coming to Europe and that there will be bank runs in Spain and Italy over the next few weeks. This is very strong language for the most famous personality on the most watched financial news channel in the United States to be using. I'm predicting bank runs, Spain and Italy within the next few weeks without an, a coordinated policy. There is going to be financial anarchy in Europe and it is going to cause a slowdown worldwide, China and here. This must be dealt with. The Germans are in charge, and they're pro-austerity, not growth. Well, of course, if you were reading Infowars.com two or three years ago, you would have heard something very similar. And we're already witnessing the bank runs in Greece as of last week. Massive, you know, what was it, nearly a billion dollars taken out in banks just over a few days. And as we reported... The elite's concern is not necessarily about Greece. Of course, they couldn't give a damn about it as an individual sovereign country. It's about the threat of a good example. If Greece drop out of the euro, and this is what top Bilderberg members have said, if they drop out and then they go on to stage an economic recovery in the aftermath of dropping out of the euro single currency, then that threat of a good example may just be too much to resist for these other European countries. And that's why the establishment has been so desperate to install its uh, Goldman Sachs technocrats over the globe because, you know, they don't want to see a trickle turn into a stampede and crush their whole dream of European 
federal super state, which was, of course, the brainchild of Bilderberg itself from way back in 1955, decades before the Maastricht Treaty that formally introduced the euro single currency. Ken Bennett, Arizona Secretary of State, gets response from Hawaii on Obama birth certificate request. This is out of the Huffington Post. Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett has reportedly received a response from the state of Hawaii regarding his request for verification that President Obama was born in the United States. According to KTVK in Phoenix, the Hawaii Attorney General's office told Bennett that he must take a number of steps, including proving that the confirmation is necessary to update his office's records in, or in order to receive the verification. And basically, there's a quote from uh, Bennett, I'm not a birther. I believe the president was born in Hawaii, or at least I hope he was. But my responsibility as Secretary of State is to make sure that the ballots in Arizona are correct and that those people whose names are on the ballot have met the qualifications for the office they are seeking. And of course, in addition to that, uh, thousands of people from Arizona have demanded that he look into this. And of course, events on Friday told us that the birther issue is not going to go away. We've actually got quotes, though, out of TPM, kind of the uh, leftist media response to all this. Quote, Bennett caved to a fringe group of activists, again, thousands of people, fringe group, just in that one state alone, who believe in a conspiracy theory that just never seems to die, no matter how much proof they get. Oh, you mean the proof of a uh, long-form birth certificate that a 12-year-old kid with a basic knowledge of Adobe Photoshop could pull apart in five minutes, which is supposed to be written on a typewriter but clearly has computerized text in it. That proof, <laughs> that what you're talking about. Here's another one out of the Talking Points memo regarding this story. Hawaiian officials have said time and again that Obama was born there in 1961, yet the theory persists. Well, I'll tell you why the theory persists. Remember Hawaii Governor Neil Abercrombie and his efforts to get a birth certificate, copy of the long form. Well, listen to this quote. Quote, there is no Barack Obama birth certificate in Hawaii. Absolutely no proof at all that he was born in Hawaii. That's what radio host Mike Evans said Abercrombie had told him. And of course, Evans later bizarrely recanted and denied it all after making such a blunt statement. But basically, the governor, Abercrombie, tried to get in and demand the records. He was a supporter of Obama. He just wanted to get him to shut people up. He got nothing. He got absolutely nothing. And then also, as Jerome Corsi reported, uh, former elections clerk in Hawaii, Tim Adams, signed a sworn affidavit saying he was told by supervisors in Hawaii that no long-form hospital-generated birth certificate existed for Barack Obama in Hawaii and that neither Queen's Medical Center nor Kapiolani Medical Center in Honolulu had any record of Obama having been born in their medical facilities. So, uh, Secretary of State Ken Bennett, good luck with getting that original birth certificate because it's proven quite difficult so far. Moving on to NATO news now, United States to unveil plans to bolster NATO alliance. President Obama, this is out of the New York Times, Obama will unveil a new package of NATO initiatives that include the alliance purchasing a fleet of surveillance drones, sharing weapons and training facilities, and sustaining nuclear deterrence in Europe, even as disarmament efforts continue with an often belligerent Russia, according to senior administration officials. So basically, this whole article is about how the US is handing over the baton of military power to NATO. So we see more you know, humanitarian invasions carried out to a greater precision around the world. And of course, now the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, has reaffirmed the fact, as we highlighted last week, that the White House now sees NATO and the UN as its boss rather than the actual United States Congress. It all makes perfect sense. So again, it's about this shift of uh, US military dominance and shifting it over to UN NATO, so it's in the hands of the international community, so they can have more of their humanitarian uh, bloodletting invasions with uh, no opposition from Congress, because all the power will have shifted to NATO and to the global government. Protesters and police clash at NATO meeting, two held on terrorism charges. Uh, they made Molotov cocktails, major act of terror. Protesters at the NATO summit meeting clash with the Chicago police officers tried to disperse thousands of people 
who had gathered several blocks from the site of the meeting and refused demands to leave. And here's another one out of The Guardian. Welcome NATO to Chicago's police state. With NATO delegates arriving Saturday night, the city of Chicago has been turned into a police state, courtesy of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who severely, who several months ago began implementing new draconian anti-protest measures. Chicago has gone on security lockdown. And of course, that meeting ends today. So massive police state again. It's a police state showcase there in Chicago. It's about um, training people that they have to get permission from the government to sit in a free speech pen about two miles away from where anything's happening. And if they try and, uh, you know, horror of horrors, express their God-given First Amendment rights, then they will be treated accordingly. It's about sending out the message to onlookers and other people watching on global television, do not protest. It is now an act of terrorism, which, of course, is how the Department of Defense now defines protest. So, you know, all the more reason to join the Occupy Bilderberg protest where the crackdown will be uh, noticeably less severe because Bilderberg don't want any attention. And as the uh, attendees at Bilderberg this year in Chantilly are going to be broadly similar to the NATO summit, you know, NATO is going to have a presence. So if you want to protest the global elite, but you don't want to get your head caved in by the loving cops, then I would suggest that you join the burgeoning Occupy Bilderberg movement, uh, which is set to take place, of course, at the end of this month, 31st of May. And on that very subject, Bilderberg agenda attracts national exposure. The secretive Bilderberg group's agenda for its 2012 meeting has attracted national attention with an article by veteran political journalist Ken Vogel exploring charges that the organization is set to play a decisive role in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. And basically... The nub of this article focuses on our piece from back in April where uh, we picked up on the fact that the Washington Post had more than suggested that Bilderberg uh, would have a hand in picking Romney's VP, which looks to be Marco Rubio. He seems to be the choice. So basically in this article, Vogel talks to Romney's advisors, who, of course, being Bilderberg attendees themselves, uh, sworn to secrecy, they deny the organization wields any power. They say, oh, you know, people get together at a nice hotel, have a nice dinner, and then go home, and that's it. Of course, we've manifestly proven that to be complete nonsense over and over again. The Bilderberg Group sets the consensus for policy, which its ad attendees then agree to carry out in their respective spheres of influence, and that's not me saying that. That was former NATO Secretary General Willie Clays, who admitted it in a 2010 radio interview. He was an attendee. He said, we go there, we create a consensus, we get our orders, we take them back, we implement them. Again, just a game of golf and a nice dinner in a nice hotel. So, you know, Occupy Bilderberg, again, shaping up to be uh, the biggest protest ever. I saw on Facebook 800 people had... Uh, completely committed to going, another 500 were maybe. Those numbers are up now probably past 1,000. You've got people who don't even use Facebook that are going to be going. So given the fact that there were around, you know, what, two, 300 in Switzerland, halfway up a mountain last year in the middle of nowhere, Chantilly, Virginia, I expect to be the biggest protest against Bilderberg ever, um, which is delightful indeed, given the fact that a few years ago, we got the leak out of Bilderberg, which is the fact that they hate people even having the financial means to travel to be able to protest their meetings. That's how arrogant they are. And their arrogance is going to be noticeably diluted as well this year because, of course, as Alex Jones has broadcast, he has two sources inside Bilderberg feeding him information on the group's secret agenda. That's how he was able to phone up the uh, Westfield's Marriott and book the hotel room, even though, you know, they say oh, there's no rooms available, because he had the code word for the conference, which is the Palm Tree Conference. He got it from his Bilderberg source. So we expect there to be many more explosive bombshell revelations out of the upcoming Bilderberg 2012 conference at the end of this month. Once again, I invite all our viewers, of course, many of you will be watching this on YouTube, to subscribe at prisonplanet.tv. This is what funds the entire operation. If nobody subscribes, then you're not going to see this on YouTube. You're not going to see it anywhere. 
you're not going to see the kind of explosive guests and information that we bring to you here at InfoWars on a daily basis. So it's $5.95 a month, discounts for yearly subscriptions. We've kept the same prices, even lowered them, even though you know it's been in operation now for eight, nine years. All the Alex Jones radio show archives, all the nightly news archives, of course, live streaming of InfoWars nightly news when it first goes out. You'll see it before anybody on YouTube sees anything. Speeches, special events, rants, behind the scenes, exclusive insider material that you're not going to see anywhere else. And it supports this network. It supports everything we do. Um, and we need your subscriptions at prisonplanet.tv. I'm going to go to the quote of the day now, which is by Carol Quigley. The use of fiat money is more justifiable in financing a depression than financing a war. So again, not only do the elites make money during times of war, they also make money during times of boom and bust. We're going to go to a break now. Coming up after the break, I'm going to talk to Syrian girl, the outspoken anti-NATO activist about the situation not only in Syria, but also the Middle East as U.S. troops now officially present in Yemen. So we're going to go to that interview after this break on InfoWars Nightly News. Stay tuned. I really enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and, uh, well, we resist them via a free market system. Hello, my fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here, introducing you to the Pro Pure family of gravity fed filters. Now, you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes, fluoride, lead, mercury, arsenic. And one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non detectable levels these poisons are gravity fed filters. And Pro Pure is the top of the line. Their filters are impregnated with silver, a natural antibiotic. On top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there. That's also available. And if you look at the different systems they offer, the ProPure big brush finish is on a stand, so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up. Then there's this big baby right here, the ProPure King large version. Got a lot of different options that come with it. Also, they have the ProPure Big, probably one of the best values out there. And of course, it's burnished stainless steel. And then what I use on my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalists obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure gravity filter system. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%.
It's the latest generation. Years in development. ProPure is the name. We're back on InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm delighted to welcome now a prominent, outspoken activist against NATO's takeover in the Middle East, and of course, rising star of YouTube, it's Syrian Girl. Syrian Girl, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm glad to be here, Paul. Well, isn't it an amazing coincidence, uh, as we see, of course, the humanitarian crises developing in Libya and Syria, you know, the, the targets of NATO regime change. Meanwhile, over in Bahrain, people are getting put in prison camps for sending tweets critical of their government. People are getting, being killed in the country by Saudi troops. But don't worry, because the UN is holding a working group discussion about the matter. So, Syrian girl, tell us about events in Bahrain. Well, one prominent thing you notice about Bahrain is it's actually missing from the mainstream media a great deal. And uh, many people will not even know that Saudi Arabia invaded Bahrain to try to quell the uprising uh, over six months ago. And now, more recently, uh, Saudi Arabia has come up with a brilliant plan that will make, Saudi, uh, make Bahrain cease to exist as a country altogether um, in a part of a Saudi Arabia-Bahrain unifi unification um, uh, proposal. So the people of Bahrain obviously are um, quite angry about this, and there's been some mass protests uh, across Bahrain. Um, and uh, it's uh, clearly uh, a breach of sovereignty. And, you know, there's been uh, human rights violations, of course. Um, I'm not Bahraini. I don't really like to comment on people's internal politics, but in this case, it's, it's obvious that a foreign power has uh, invaded um, a country by the request of the Bahraini government. But in the first place, the Bahraini government was a puppet of Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, one of the biggest crimes of Bahrain, uh, that the government of Bahrain did against its people, was the center square of Bahrain had a very um, symbolic, uh, uh, they called it the pearl, and it was a statue in the middle of the square, and people used that statue to, to rally around, and the uh, Bahrain government just uh, um, destroyed the whole symbol, the whole statue, so people wouldn't rally around it. And that's the kind of uh, attitude that the Bahrain people are facing. So moving on to, obviously we've got that situation unfolding being completely ignored by the establishment media in the West while they'll, they'll still crow about uh, the glorious Syrian rebels busy carrying out terrorist attacks again on Saturday. But meanwhile in Yemen, um, while Hillary Clinton, you know, admits that the US and Al-Qaeda are on the same side in Syria, in Yemen we've got US troops on the ground. Again, no congressional authorization. And it's all in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, even though we're on the same side as Al-Qaeda in Libya and Syria. The best enemies money can buy. And there's a quote here out of the LA Times today. Obama said in 2010 he had, quote, no intention of sending US boots on the ground to Yemen. But Army General David Petraeus, now head of the CIA, offered to secretly put U.S. Special Operations troops in the country, leaked State Department cable show. Then President Saleh rebuffed his proposal, the cable show. And then we had a convenient little Arab spring in Yemen, and Saleh, who was, you know, proving a roadblock to all this, uh, was outed. He was toast. So, Syrian girl, U.S. troops in Yemen now officially. What's the core objective behind these boots on the ground that Obama promised he would never send? Well, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, strange that um, the, U the U.S. is using Al-Qaeda to, uh, um, in a different way in Syria, and then it's using it in uh, Yemen as a pretext for an invasion. And you know, that might be something that we're going to see them try to do in Syria. Although you know, Syria's military is quite strong, so perhaps it won't be an intervention to a level of an invasion. 
But with Yemen, um, if you, you asked uh, what's the importance of it, why are they there? Well, if you look at Yemen geographically, it's right next to the Zeus Canal, and uh, it's, it's uh, with uh, an African country called uh, Djibouti. I'm not sure if I pronounced that properly. It's, uh, it, there's a little bit of a, a cutoff in that canal. And so Yemen is a very important country for imports and exports to go through uh, for control. So that was one of the reasons that uh, U.S. troops are in there. It's interesting that we never really heard about U.S. troops there until there was um, a bombing recently uh, where uh, one of these uh, trainers, they're called, um, was uh, injured in this bombing, although you know, 100 uh, Yemeni soldiers were killed in the bombing as well. Um, due to the uh, CIA terrorist organization, Al Qaeda. So we've got that situation unfolding again. Another domino they're trying to topple there in the Middle East. I want to focus it back on Syria again. Uh, because, you know, when the Arab League went into Syria and reported there was violence on both sides, the uh, Western establishment media couldn't care less. So then we had the. Uh, also independent UN, who have now gone in as observers. And we learn from the uh, photographic and video evidence that they're palling around with Al-Qaeda, those same, you know, bad guys that were in Yemen to fight. And actually under protection in this independent mission, under protection of the rebels. So given that, Syrian girl, how independent do you think the UN mission in Syria really is? It's never been independent. Uh, we've seen uh, the UN, you know, being used as a tool to create wars for a long time now. And uh, I think the whole point of the UN ceasefire is just to give the rebels a chance to regroup and rearm because uh, it came at, the, at the ceasefire was suggested at a time when they suffered a huge defeat in uh, Bab Amr, which is a district in Homs, uh, where they had a stronghold, and the uh, military, uh, of the Syrian military actually went in, into it. So quickly then, uh, we saw all these diplomatic uh, uh, overtures from uh, the UN and NATO to try to uh, salvage whatever is left of this uh, um, sectarian insurgency. And this is, what the ceasefire has been used as, it uh, could have been worse if it wasn't for the um, Russian changes in the um, peace plan. But uh, of course, you know, it was going to fail from the start because uh, the uh, insurgents themselves failed to agree to it. And uh, um, they continued their offensive. Only the um, Syrian military had its hands tied behind its back by the ceasefire and couldn't uh, um, attack uh, the insurgency to the full. So that's really the, the point of the whole thing. And uh, it's funny to uh, assume that uh, the NATO side is wanting to see the ceasefire succeed, because as it was going, what has happened in Syria, um, the international uh, uh, EU and NATO has increased sanctions against Syria. And they have openly uh, uh, declared monetary funding and uh, non-weapon aid to the rebels, although Syria and the Lebanese military has been capturing weapons shipments, uh, huge ones, um, over the last few months since the ceasefire was declared. So it's, it's obvious that uh, at, at least you know, the, the EU and uh, NATO have no intention for there to be peace or a ceasefire, and they're actively um, undermining the so-called uh, ceasefire. Well, a lot of people say it's, it's just a holding pattern to get the uh, rebels organized, because we now know that the arms are flowing in, funded by the US, of course, and the talk is that that observer mission is merely a stopgap until they can get those rebels, rebel brigades organized for a proper offensive, but we shall see. Sticking with Syria, though, another topic I find fascinating, because it directly relates to some of the stuff we put out, is our friend Syria Danny. Um, because isn't it interesting how 
almost immediately after that embarrassing performance on CNN's Anderson Cooper, himself a former CIA agent, you know, completely harmless, I, I presume, completely failed to defend his role in staging war propaganda, this Syria Danny, after he was caught doing so on video. And Syrian girl, isn't it the case that he's basically now disappeared almost completely after being exposed as basically a, a war propagandist? Yes, they have no more use for him as he's been uh, debunked and exposed by none other than, uh, none other than Infowars. And you know, the video of him forging the interview existed for two weeks on the internet and nobody picked up the story except for Infowars and only once they did was Anderson Cooper forced to uh, basically distance himself from Downing with this uh, botched uh, whitewash that they attempted uh, on their show. So um, unfortunately though, there's continuing disinformation coming out from the media, uh, if not with the use of this Danny, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of other uh, people to buy off. Uh, and there's, a, there's been an, a recent piece of information that uh, from the FSA that they killed six Syrian officials and Al Jazeera picks this up, you know, and, and then other media have picked it up. And in fact, all of those uh, government officials came out and said they're alive. So the lies continue, and I don't think we've seen the end of them. Uh, here's a common question, but it's, it's one I'm going to ask. What do you say to people who say, well, this Syrian girl is just being paid by the Assad regime to propagandize and cover up the, the uh, fact that his government's killed 10,000 people? Well, I think that it's just an easy way to put aside everything I say and delegitimize it when uh, it's obvious that I've uh, stood um, clearly in my position that I have always been um, a patriotic opposition to the government. I've, I have no links at all to the Ba'ath Party, um, and these allegations, you know, they're just um, a way to tarnish uh, someone's image and someone's name um, by people who don't like what I'm saying. And um, I wonder who benefits least from what I'm saying. And, you know, they would have something to gain from claiming that I'm somehow li linked to the Syrian government. Well, you know, I, I guess we've got the entirety of the Western establishment media pushing the line that these uh, glorious rebels are in fact freedom fighters when they're carrying out terrorist attacks on a weekly basis. So I guess that angle's covered. <laughs> well, actually, another story I read in the Financial Times a few days ago was written by Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is a CFR member. And she was basically saying, look, we've reached an impasse with this serious situation. Nothing much is happening. They haven't you know, overthrown the regime as soon as they wanted. She said, let's arm the citizens with smartphones and facilitate them the ability to upload abuse videos to a centralized UN hub. So they're actually proposing going in there, arming people with cameras and cell phones and saying, you can go and upload, you, you know, your, your Syria Danny style propaganda videos to our UN hub. Does, it, <laughs> does that sound open to abuse or what? I think it's pretty strange because that already happened. The, um, most of the insurgents are armed with high-powered cameras, and I have video evidence of this because they all pulled them out when the UN monitors were present. And, you know, smartphones exist in Syria already, so what you're saying is a bit ludicrous and outdated because this has already been happening since the beginning. And, of course, it's, it's, uh, um, it's being abused. And, uh, you know, these uh, Al Jazeera and CNN and BBC and France 24, they, they love this um, one-sided view from a shaky camera that nobody can really tell what happened or who shot who, because then they can make whatever they want out of it. Um, and it, it's, I think it's clear that after such time has passed where the Syrian people stand, you know, there's, there's not been any uh, mass rallies in the street to the level that we saw in Egypt. 
So um, if she wants to know what Syrian opinion is, she only needs to look at that. Okay, we're gonna. Is there any? Uh, tell people how they can get your material. I believe it's mainly on YouTube, isn't it? Um. Yes. Uh. It. I have a Twitter account also. It's Partisan Girl, and I also have a YouTube. And I just wanted to say one last thing because I was asked to by some um, Syrian compatriots that uh, live in Sydney, Australia that they've been um, attacked by uh, sectarian uh, forces that have burnt down their mosque, um, which is an Alawite mosque. So I just wanted to um, say that the, the, the sectarian over, um, tone of this insurgency is just increasing. And thank you for um, this interview. Okay, we'll continue to watch developments in Syria and the Middle East as a whole with interest. Syrian girl, thanks for joining us on InfoWars Nightly News. Thank you. That's going to do it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. We will see you on tomorrow night's show. Again, I urge you to subscribe at prisonplanet.tv, but that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you.